Hello, our friends, Evolutionary Energy Arts family. Hello there. Welcome back. And we want to thank Patricia. She is our newest uh, Patreon. So thank you so much, Patricia. Thank you, Patricia. Yes, we couldn't do it without you and all the support we get over on Patreon, also on Ko-Fi. And quite a few people have been doing uh, the Ko-Fi's as well. Brother Mark, you know, uh, hey, you've been with us a long time. Uh, gosh, I, I think, I don't know, almost since the very beginning. So thank you, Mark in Kansas. Thank you so much, Mark. So guys, I'm going to do something we don't usually do. Um, and I'm going to play somebody else's video. I've been looking to see if it's Creative Commons, uh, which means that you're allowed to share it. So hopefully this will go through and it won't get um, copyright strikes and everything and all that. But I just think it was so well done. I think it was great. I think it gives us a, a real idea um, in the terms of a story as to what's really going on on planet Earth. Yeah, it does a really good job. At how it shows how we are being manipulated and how you know we're actually unknowingly doing this to each other. Yeah, this is perfect. Honestly, I, I, I couldn't come up with a better little uh drama and and thank you so much our dearest sister kate um we love and appreciate you thank you so much kate so without further ado we're gonna go over here and it's called the jones plantation larkin rose uh which coincidentally enough has about the same subscribers the evolutionary has been stuck on it's, you know, we're at 66.5, then we're at 66.6, then we're back at 66.5. Well, they're at 65.7. So uh, that is the name of this YouTube channel. Listen, enjoy, and just catch the deep insight and what's really going on here. This really, I, I thought was just, I always want to say bravo. This was so well done. Mr. Jones owned a cotton plantation and many slaves. One day he was talking to the owner of the plantation next to his and Mr. Jones was lamenting the fact that times were tough, he was having to work his slaves harder than ever and was having trouble with some of them being disobedient or trying to run away. The other plantation owner said he knew someone who could help. Day one. One day Mr. Jones called his slaves together so a man named Mr. Smith could talk to them. Before beginning, Mr. Smith whispered to Mr. Jones, Whatever I say, do not contradict me or interfere, and I promise you, your slave troubles will end. My name is Mr. Smith, he said to the slaves, and this may be the happiest day of your lives. From today forward, you will no longer be slaves, but free men. Mr. Jones was so shocked, he started to step forward, but Mr. Smith gestured for him to remain silent. He did, only because the other plantation owner had spoken so highly of Mr. Smith's skills. You are no longer the property of Mr. Jones, Mr. Smith continued. You are free. No more would you be forced to labor for the benefit of Mr. Jones. Now you can work for yourselves. Now the slaves were all murmuring and looking at each other. Many were smiling, many were looking puzzled. In fact, you are now free to leave the plantation whenever you want, Mr. Smith said. However, since we are surrounded by other plantations, if you leave, some other plantation owner will likely claim you as his own the moment you set foot on his property. So I urge you not to risk your newfound freedom by doing something so foolish. Instead, I suggest that you stay here, no longer as slaves, but as willing participants and part owners of this plantation. Yes, this is now your plantation. Mr. Jones bit his tongue to keep from objecting. For now, we might as well leave Mr. Jones in charge, said Mr. Smith, since he is the only one with any experience at running a plantation, which is quite a complicated thing to manage. But he will no longer be your master, but just another worker on the plantation. In fact, he will now be using his organizational and management skills to serve you. Whatever problems you may have had with him before, you are now all equals, and you need each other to make this work. If we all cooperate and work together, we can all reap the benefits together. In honor of this happy occasion, I present you this new symbol of togetherness and cooperation, this flag, which shall be the emblem of the new free Jones Plantation. He held up the new flag, but most of those listening were still too amazed to respond. And this shall be our motto, Mr. Smith announced. 
We work together as free men for our mutual benefit, pledging our allegiance to the Jones Plantation, which stands for prosperity, liberty, and justice for all. To celebrate, everyone has the rest of the day off. Enjoy your freedom, do as you please, and be back here tomorrow morning, bright and early, so that we may begin work on this great and noble new endeavor as equal free men. Finally convinced that Mr. Smith was serious, the former slaves applauded and cheered. Day two. We all want this plantation to do well, Mr. Smith said at the beginning of the next meeting, so we can all share the benefits. We all know that it takes a lot of effort to make a cotton plantation work. Just because you're all free doesn't mean you can stop working. In fact, since you're now working for yourselves, I expect you to work even harder than ever before, but now with pride and joy, knowing that you're working for yourselves. Of course, there still have to be rules. If everyone just does whatever he wants, the plantation won't produce anything. This experiment will fail and we'll all starve. You should be thankful that Mr. Jones has agreed to stay on to lend his knowledge and skills to this endeavor, and I trust you will all do your own part to make this work. Several of you have been chosen to act as project supervisors to manage different aspects of the operation, to make sure everyone is doing his assigned job, to make sure that the rules are followed, and so on. The rest of you may head out to the fields to start your first day of work as free men. Day three. The next morning, Mr. Smith had a grim expression on his face as the daily meeting began. I have an unpleasant duty to do today, he said. Yesterday, Charles was caught keeping some of the cotton he picked, presumably to sell for his own personal profit. That is against the rules. That is stealing. For that, Charles must be punished. Two men tied Charles to the whipping post. I take no joy in this, Mr. Smith continued. But you must understand, if we do not maintain order, if we do not have rules that we all abide by, then the plantation will fail, and we will all suffer. The whip cracked against Charles' back. But if we all pitch in for the common good, then we can all prosper. Being free doesn't mean you should be selfish and greedy. We must each do our assigned duties and obey the rules, and then we can all benefit, and each of you will receive your appropriate share of the profits. A young man named Samuel stepped forward. But if you and Mr. Jones decide the rules and whip us if we disobey, how is that any different from what we had before? How can you say that, Mr. Smith asked. I'm shocked. You were a slave before, and now you're free. Things still need to be managed and organized by those best qualified to do so. Do you know how to run a plantation, Samuel? Well, no, he answered. But if we're free, why do we get no say in what the rules are and how things work? I'm surprised at your ingratitude, Mr. Smith answered. None of you know how a plantation is run, so you're in no position to be making decisions about how things are done here. You don't seem to appreciate all the things that Mr. Jones provides for you, from protecting you from all the outside threats that you know nothing about, those who would come here, capture and enslave you, if not for Mr. Jones' protection, to making sure that you all have food and housing, tools to work with, that you're cared for when sick and injured, and so on. There wouldn't be a plantation at all, no cotton to pick, no land to plant and harvest, if not for him. You should be grateful that he's made possible the level of comfort you now have. Your lives would be far worse if not for him. Nevertheless, as free and equal participants in this endeavor, from now on at each meeting, any worker may have two minutes to ask questions or voice suggestions or complaints. With that, the workers all seemed satisfied and headed out again to the fields to pick the cotton. Day four. I have a big announcement, Mr. Smith said as the daily meeting began. Mr. Jones' cousin is here, and not just to visit and see how our project is coming along. It has been decided that from now on, you will be deciding who will manage the plantation. Of course, this job can't be done by just anyone, but every three months we will have a special meeting at which all the workers will vote on whether we think Mr. Jones should run the plantation or whether we think his cousin, Mr. Johnson, should run the plantation. That means that ultimately you are in charge because you will be deciding which man you want running things on your behalf. If you don't like the way things are being managed, you now have the power to change it. Amazed and pleased, the workers headed out again to the fields to pick the cotton. Days passed, months passed, a year passed, and the plantation continued to operate as before. Sometimes Mr. Jones was in charge, sometimes Mr. Johnson was in charge, but the day-to-day -day routine stayed exactly the same. The workers worked hard, long hours every day and still had little to show for it. Every day the meeting would begin with them all reciting the Jones Plantation motto, We work together as free men for our mutual benefit. 
pledging our allegiance to the Jones Plantation, which stands for prosperity, liberty, and justice for all. One day, Mr. Smith announced, Samuel is asked to say a few words this morning, and whatever the rest of us may think of his ideas and opinions, we are all free here, and that means we are all allowed to speak our minds. So, Samuel, you have two minutes. Begin. Samuel stepped forward, looking scared. I was excited when all this started, he began, glancing nervously at Mr. Smith and Mr. Jones. But don't you all see what's happened here? Nothing has changed. We're all still slaves. There were grumbles of disagreement from the crowd. They tell us what to do and whip us if we don't. They still make all the rules and punish us if we disobey. They let us make suggestions and complain about things, but they never really change anything. They let us choose between Mr. Jones and Mr. Johnson, but what's the difference? The situation stays the same. We do all of the work and they take as much as they want and decide how much they'll let us keep. They live in luxury made rich by the cotton we pick, we do all the work and have to build our own huts, grow our own food, and take care of ourselves. They leave us just enough that we don't revolt or run away. This is not freedom. We're all still slaves. They've only changed the words they use, but nothing else has changed. They say we're all free and equal, but we're not. They command and we obey. That's not freedom. That's not equality. They say we're free to leave, but all that means is that we're free to be someone else's slave. Why should we work or obey the rules? We didn't agree to this. They made the system. They forced it on us. They control and rob us and call it freedom. They've deceived you into thinking that being able to choose which slave master you'll work for is the same as being free. It's not. Open your eyes. If you keep what you produce, they call it stealing. When they take what you produce, they call it sharing and fair distribution. Can't you see that this is all your time is up, Samuel? Mr. Smith announced calmly. At his gesture, two supervisors grabbed Samuel by the arms and led him to the whipping post. I'm sorry, Samuel, but you've broken the rules. There are rules against encouraging others not to work and encouraging others to break the rules. You're only hurting all of us with your discontentment and your complaining and your disobedience. The whip fell and Samuel let out a grunt. Without rules, without order, all would be lost. Without law, there would be chaos. We can't just behave as wild animals, each doing whatever he pleases. We must all follow the plan and all do our duty for the betterment of everyone. And those who do not must be punished. The whip fell again and blood flowed freely from Samuel's back. Samuel, it is you who are stealing from the others. When you don't do your assigned work, you are making more work for others. When you disobey the rules, it is you who are endangering the future of everyone else here. You are the thief. You are the criminal. You are the one trying to destroy the arrangement that keeps us all safe and prosperous. At every lash of the whip, the other workers cheered louder and louder, some yelling curses at Samuel. Being spoiled and selfish, you complain about everything, talking as if you're oppressed. But you are the one ruining things. You are the one keeping us from being all we could be. It is your greed and your rebelliousness that is hurting all of us. They all play by the rules, Mr. Smith said, gesturing at the others. What makes you think that you don't have to? You think you're above the law? There were loud yells of agreement as the whip fell again. We must maintain order, Mr. Smith proclaimed, to make this plantation great, to make it so that we can all be happy and prosperous. To have the society we want, there have to be rules. We all have to contribute our fair share to this great endeavor, and we cannot tolerate actions and attitudes that seek to undermine the amazing things that together as free men we have achieved and will continue to achieve. Mr. Jones was smiling as he gave Mr. Smith a pat on the back. The crowd was cheering so loudly that none of them had noticed that Samuel had died. What you have been taught about government and politics is no more accurate or reasonable than what Mr. Smith taught the slaves. If you're ready to look through the veil of rhetoric and propaganda to see the reality beneath, Get a copy of The Most Dangerous Superstition. It will change the way you see the world. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think that kind of says it all. So, you know, again, when you think about being patriotic or think about labeling yourself in any way, shape, or form with any of the labels that we've been given by the control system, we're totally falling into their playbook. Mm-hmm. It's so unfortunate, too. You know, they're very 
crafty when it comes to putting these things together and then understanding it comes from a higher place that then we can perceive and they keep themselves out of sight but they know how to set up the structure to get us to actually work against each other but still work for them yeah absolutely and again they, they've given us our major religious systems they've given us our political systems they give us these national boundaries they make you patriotic they encourage patriotism you know hey you live in the greatest country in the world and then over on the other side hey you live in the greatest country of the world no look you live the greatest country of the world this is what they do divide and conquer keep the slaves working all the while we have ourselves a little bit of a disclosure going on again it's a disclosure with a twist and this is mentioning in uh, Grusha's testimony that the U.S. was scooping up a craft from Italy in 1933 in which Mussolini and the Vatican assisted in covering up. Remains inside of this flying wing-shaped craft were described as human-like with distinct differences. There's many species out there. And again, this is absolutely an interdimensional, intergalactic war. But when we look to uh, these national boundaries and recognize that it is USA Inc. These are all corporations. It, it's, again, co why you even have corporations? It's because you, again, are protecting the shareholders so they cannot directly be held responsible for anything that goes wrong in the corporation. This is no different than the plantation system that we are looking at. Again, it, it is exactly a, a, a wonderful parable, a wonderful little story for what's going on in, in this world. And still, so many people have discovered some of the system, but they're still totally caught up in other aspects that they can't let go of because of the indoctrination that they've received from the time they were little kids. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really serious. Belief system is everything. It's everything. It, and they know that. That's the thing. The controllers know that. That's why they put the belief system out in front of us to structure us in such a way to keep us controlled. And we need to be able to look outside of that. And... In our hands it should we should never turn our health over to entities that benefit from our sickness you know what what does that tell us absolutely the fluoride in the water the chlorine in the water the now the nanu nanu in the water and the air and again they control every aspect of the system that we find ourselves in and it's all about keeping us in just enough uh, with just enough intelligence, with just long enough lives to be productive, but not too long, where we could figure things out and and share that knowledge and break out of the system. So I hope you guys found this interesting. It was, uh, I thought, very well done. And maybe, you know, looking at it in a different format, it'll just resonate a little deeper. Indeed. As always, God bless, because there is, there is a creator, and there are so many beings that have been called God, and they want you to think that they're the creator, because they've played with our chromosomes, they've played with our DNA, but no, they're, they're just slave masters. That's all they are, plantation owners on plantation earth. Source bless and namaste. Namaste.